Greetings and welcome back to room 303 in sophomore English. We turn now in unit 6 to our final two titles. And in fact, our final two titles of our sophomore volume. We're going to do some comparing again of literary works, just like we did at the end of other units. We'll be comparing themes and worldviews with two titles. We're going to first of all take a look at the ancient Greek legend of uh, Damon Pythias, and then we're going to look at Maupassant's two friends. I'm going to start on 1228. Just read with me for your notes at 2B. The theme of a literary work is the central message or idea about life that it conveys. Many themes are universal, appearing in the literature of different time periods and places. The struggle between good and evil, for example, is a universal theme. The theme of a literary work often reflects the author's worldview, basic beliefs that shape the author's outlook. A writer's worldview is influenced by the time and place in which he or she lives. For example, in past eras, many writers portrayed a well-ordered world in which every event happens for a reason and true heroes defend the innocent. Such writers might have shown good people being rewarded while bad people are punished. By contrast, Many modern writers depict a chaotic or an indifferent world filled with ordinary, limited people. Modern writers may show good people triumphing over terrible odds or may show bad people succeeding. When compared with traditional works, the thematic insights in modern literature usually reflect a worldview in which justice is uncertain and order is not always restored. Moral Dilemma and Theme, next bold uh, heading. Writers often convey a literary work's theme by confronting characters with moral dilemmas. A moral dilemma is a situation in which potential actions conflict with the character's idea of right and wrong. Like themes, the moral dilemmas characters face reflect the time and place in which the writer lives. Both Damon and Pythias, an ancient legend, and Two Friends, a Mo a more modern short story, center on the theme of friendship. So you want to write that down. Both these titles are going, to, are going to deal with the theme of friendship. Each involves characters who face moral dilemmas that test the bonds of friendship, yet each work is filtered through a different cultural worldview. As you read, identify the central message expressed in each story. Then we're going to use a chart like the one shown to compare and contrast differences in themes as well as moral dilemmas as we get ready, obviously, for a piece of writing. Let's jump to 1229 quickly and meet the first of the two titles. Again, of course, the, the, the big question here is can anyone be a hero? We've obviously dealt with that on any number of levels. Ancient Greek legends and their retellers. Like other legends, Damien and Pythias exaggerates the characteristics of people to provide examples of the best and the worst conduct. In this way, a legend serves as a cultural how-to manual, showing people which virtues they should honor and cultivate. Over the centuries, the legend of Damien Pythias has been retold and adapted in many forms, including plays. William F. Russell, a recent reteller of this and many other myths and legends, is also the author of a widely read newspaper column on education. Let's turn now to the text itself on 1230, and let's just enjoy this selection. Here, we're going to have a cruel tyrant, uh, Dionysius, who demands that Pythias be executed. Damon agrees to risk his own life while his friend settles his affairs. When the tyrant finally realizes how nobly the two friends behave, he will spare them. Now, let's just enjoy the reading of this. It's a very short reading, and yet a very powerful reading of a retelling of a story that's an ancient legend. Let's just enjoy. Here we go. Damon and Pythias, retold by William F. Russell, EDD. Damon and Pythias were two noble young men who lived on the island of Sicily in a city called Syracuse. They were such close companions and were so devoted to each other that all the people of the city admired them as the highest examples of true friendship. Each trusted the other so completely that nobody could ever have persuaded one that the other had been unfaithful or dishonest, even if that had been the case. Now it happened that Syracuse was, at that time, ruled by a famous tyrant named Dionysius, who had gained the throne for himself through treachery, and who from then on flaunted his power by behaving cruelly to his own subjects and to all strangers and enemies who were so unfortunate as to fall into his clutches. 
this tyrant, Dionysius, was so unjustly cruel that once, when he awoke from a restless sleep during which he dreamt that a certain man in the town had attempted to kill him, he immediately had that man put to death. It happened that Pythias had, quite unjustly, been accused by Dionysius of trying to overthrow him, and for this supposed crime of treason, Pythias was sentenced by the king to die. Try as he might, Pythias could not prove his innocence to the king's satisfaction, and so all hope now lost. The noble youth asked only for a few days' freedom, so that he could settle his business affairs and see to it that his relatives would be cared for after he was executed. Dionysius, the hard-hearted tyrant, however, would not believe Pythias's promise to return, and would not allow him to leave unless he left behind him a hostage, someone who would be put to death in his place if he should fail to return within the stated time. Pythias immediately thought of his friend Damon, and he unhesitatingly sent for him in this hour of dire necessity, never thinking for a moment that his trusty companion would refuse his request. Nor did he, for Damon hastened straight away to the palace, much to the amazement of King Dionysius, and gladly offered to be held hostage for his friend, in spite of the dangerous condition that had been attached to this favor. 1231. Therefore, Pythias was permitted to settle his earthly affairs before departing to the land of the shades, while Damon remained behind in the dungeon, the captive of the tyrant Dionysius. All right, so we've got, you know, a standard motif here. You've got Dionysius, the nasty tyrant king, go back at 3A to Antigone. This is our Creon character in many ways. He rules with his power, with his despotism. And then you've got the two friends, right? Now, notice that you've got Pythias, who has been accused falsely, and Damon, who is his best friend, who's going to stand in for him so Pythias can go and take care of his affairs. And, of course, if Pythias doesn't come back, then Damon's going to end up being the one jacked. Notice that for Dionysus, it's, it's the king, the tyrant. He's kind of shocked at this level of friendship. Let's watch now how the story ends, all right? After Pythias had been released, Dionysius asked Damon if he did not feel afraid, for Pythias might very well take advantage of the opportunity he had been given and simply not return at all, and then he, Damon, would be executed in his place. Right. But Damon replied at once with a willing smile, There is no need for me to feel afraid, O king, since I have perfect faith in the word of my true friend and I know that he will certainly return before the appointed time, unless, of course, he dies, or is held captive by some evil force. Even so, even should the noble Pythias be captured and held against his will, it would be an honor for me to die in his place. Such devotion and perfect faith as this was unheard of to the friendless tyrant. Still, though he could not help admiring the true nobility of his captive, he nevertheless determined that Damon should certainly be put to death should Pythias not return by the appointed time. And, as the fates would have it, by a strange turn of events, Pythias was detained far longer in his task than he had imagined. Though he never for a single minute intended to evade the sentence of death to which he had been so unjustly committed, Pythias met with several accidents and unavoidable delays. Now his time was running out, and he had yet to overcome the many impediments that had been placed in his path. At last he succeeded in clearing away all the hindrances, and he sped back the many miles to the palace of the king, his heart almost bursting with grief and fear that he might arrive too late. Meanwhile, when the last day of the allotted time arrived, Dionysius commanded that the place of execution should be readied at once since he was still ruthlessly determined that if one of his victims escaped him, the other should not. And so, entering the chamber in which Damon was confined, he began to utter words of sarcastic pity for the foolish faith, as he termed it, that the young man of Syracuse had in his friend. In reply, however, Damon merely smiled, since, in spite of the fact that the eleventh hour had already arrived, he still believed that his lifelong companion would not fail him. 
Even when, a short time later, he was actually led out to the site of his execution, his serenity remained the same. 1232. Great excitement stirred the crowd that had gathered to witness the execution, for all the people had heard of the bargain that had been struck between the two friends. There was much sobbing, and cries of sympathy were heard all around as the captive was brought out, though he himself somehow retained complete composure even at this moment of darkest danger. Presently, the excitement grew more intense still, as a swift runner could be seen approaching the palace courtyard at an astonishing speed, and wild shrieks of relief and joy went up as Pythias, breathless and exhausted, rushed headlong through the crowd and flung himself into the arms of his beloved friend, sobbing with relief that he had, by the grace of the gods, arrived in time to save Damon's life. This final exhibition of devoted love and faithfulness was more than even the stony heart of Dionysius, the tyrant, could resist. As the throng of spectators melted into tears at the companion's embrace, the king approached the pair and declared that Pythias was hereby pardoned and his death sentence canceled. In addition, he begged the pair to allow him to become their friend, to try to be as much a friend to them both as they had shown each other to be. Thus did the two friends of Syracuse, by the faithful love they bore to each other, conquer the hard heart of a tyrant king. And in the annals of true friendship, there are no more honored names than those of Damon and Pythias, for no person can do more than be willing to lay down his life for the sake of his friend. Of course, we are immediately reminded of the passage in the New Testament, the Bible, greater love has no man than this to lay down his life for his brother, that first John passage. And of course, we're playing a very similar game here. Let's make sure that we get at level one now, the, the entire events. So notice Pythias is away. Damon is like, hey, if I got, you know, he'll be back. I trust my friend. Sure enough, at the last second, Pythias shows up. Notice that Dionysius is the uh, tyrant whose heart has then changed the power of a model, if you will. And he asks if he can, in fact, be their friend as well. I want that kind of loyalty in my life because he recognizes he doesn't have it. At 2A, what for you is a major message or theme here? Several, obviously. One is the power of true friendship. That is to say, a true friend totally believes, right, in the other and knows that the other cares about about not just himself but about the other as well. To that degree, a second major message here is the idea that a, a person who doesn't believe in friendship can be in fact blown away when he or she witnesses true friendship and it somehow affects in, in, in their heart a desire to have that very thing. In other words, above all things, that's what I want in my life as a friend just like that. Of course, at to uh, at 2B. We could talk about the tension that's created here. We could talk, obviously, about the symbolism of the power of love, Damien and Pythias, the two men from Syracuse, representative or symbolic of true love, love between uh, each other, the willingness to stand in and take, uh, if you will, take the bullet for the other. At 3A, what is for you your greatest text of friendship? What is for you the great text of um, a song or a film, a movie, a video that demonstrates that notion of the true friend, the penultimate friend. And then finally, of course, at 3A, we could write down Julius Caesar and the ways in which Brutus and Caesar are supposedly friends and Caesar can't believe that he sold them out. Et tu Brute is those, fa those famous lines at the end for Shakespeare. At 3B, what are your thoughts about friendship? couple of questions here for you to think about. What are, what are your thoughts about friendship? Do you have a friend that is close enough that would take one for you? Do you? Do you, have, wait, do you have somebody who you would take one for your friend? Do you have that depth of friendship? Is it possible to develop that depth of friendship at so young an age as a sophomore in high school? Do you think you could, you could do that? And finally, what is a time in your life when you witnessed something good happen and it affected you in the same way that our tyrant here wants to now become a friend. Do you have a story like that in your own life that comes to mind? Well, we study this story to set us up now for the next story, Maupassant's Two Friends.
which will play off of this theme in some really dark ways. Thank you.